Welcome everyone to this fortnightly session. Um, for, this is uh, tools of frontline staff who are working with yeah, residents who are struggling with um, poverty or the cost of living crisis. Um, and yeah, we've got two people who have come along um, today to present. Um, so we've got Ruth from Eat Club, um, who's gonna talk about their offer and their services. And then Emma has come along from Citizens Online, who uh, is gonna talk about some really important work uh, around digital inclusion. Um, so uh, I think we've got Ruth on the call. I think I saw her earlier. So I'm going to pass over to Ruth. And if you want to uh, take it away, um, please do. Hi, um, thank you, John. And um, thank you, Jenny, for the invite to the meeting. And apologies that I think this is probably my first meeting. So not only am I presenting, but it's my first time attending as well. Um, so thank you very much for the, the invite. Um, so eClub is a small London based charity, predominantly um, works with young people across London, teaching them the valuable cooking and life skills. We have a team of trained chefs, we go out to the young people wherever they are, the big community centres, um, big centres, homelessness charities, etc. Um, and the reason why I'm on this call today, apart from you know, wanting to endeavour work further into ACNI is that we have been successful in the tender from Hackney Council to deliver community cooking workshops with adults and families in the borough over the next two years. So we're sort of officially starting in January and for the next two years we'll be working in Hackney and the Tender. So we have worked in Hackney many times in the past, but a lot more with young people, which is our main unit. So one of the things I'm here to do today is try to engage more with people who work with adults because apart from delivering the workshops, we, as part of the requirement of the sender, is to have other referral organisations that are going to work with us on this. So whether it's young people, whether it's people participating in the sessions being referred to our, set, to our sessions, sorry, and our courses, or whether it is after they complete the courses, giving them opportunities to help with debt or with um, energy issues, you know, all kinds of things that you know, we can use our space to discuss. So that's also an invitation for anyone um, who would like to participate actively during the courses to come and present um, to the participants during the meals. That could be another way to have, you know, to all our sessions and when we could come together and eating together and I think the shared meals are always great opportunities to discuss issues so this is a really open invitation to anyone and everyone and i'm going to put at some point a link in the chat or maybe john you can share it for anyone who would like to then get in touch get any more information just has like are you a partner are you a resident or would you like to be a referral referral partner for us so that's for me. I think um, it'd be nice if people want to ask questions instead of just moving mm -hmm. Thanks, Ruth. Brilliant. Um, so, does, has anyone um, got any questions for Ruth? Perhaps a bit more about, uh, it'd be good maybe to hear like a bit more in detail about the sort of um, the classes and, and um, yeah. maybe yeah, yeah, and where does each club come from, really, I suppose. Yeah, probably one of the things I should have said is that the tender is split into two and we're just covering um, workshops in the south of the borough. So anything all the way from east to west, including the city of London. So I think this is this is our remit for, for this. And the way, like I said in the beginning of what I said, the way that we normally work is that we're not based anywhere and the work is are delivered in partnership. So for this program as well, we have got some partnerships already with these organisations that we've worked with many times over the years, but there is, we are contracted to deliver 10 courses this year with families and with adults. So there's definitely scope for, for other groups who think that's something that would work for them. We need roughly 12 participants per session for six sessions of sort of two hours each where we come together to cook and eat. Um, this course will be tailored specifically um, to the group's needs, whether it is you know, a very 
spend it on your time to cooking on a budget or just basic cooking skills or how to reduce food waste in the home, those kind of things that would be specifically relevant to the group. Um, it just depends on obviously, depending on the groups that we get, we want to make this culturally relevant. So things that people would like to cook, um, would like to learn how to cook, would like to eat, or maybe you know, everyone wants to do this about how to cook Vietnamese food. I don't know. But yeah, so it's we're gonna create all these in partnership with the the groups that we work with. Brilliant. It sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Um I'm sure there's lots of people on the call who, who will be working with residents who would who would massively benefit from it. And um great that um they're sort of going to be i guess almost co-produced based on the based on the people that are actually going to be taking part um claudette did you want to come in yeah i just wanted to ask what age group um are the young people what what does it range from so normally we work with young people but this contract is specifically for adults so i think the council counts adults as anyone from 18 or over so for us some of these we would consider young people as well, but adults of any ages, and that would be parents with children. I think when they say parents with children, it's normally parents with children in primary age, but happy to work with young mums. I think if anyone works with young mums, that's definitely very, very high on my list of people I'd like to work with. So, or young, or, the, or young dads. I think they just say young dads. Okay, thanks. Does anyone else have any questions about it? Um, how to get in touch with oh, Charlie? Do you want to come in? Hi. Um, have you reached out to Shoreditch Fest because they've got all kind of, they've got a thing called Bump Buddies, which is also works with particularly young young mums and those are expecting. If that seems like a demographic you want to target, they might be kind of worth speaking to. Um. No, I think Shoreditch Trust, I'm going to write this down. Um, I think they were the ones that were delivering this um, contract previously. So, um, yeah, I definitely have some contact there. I'm happy to reach out. Can you say the organization name again? So, if I can write it down, please. The session they run is Bump Buddies. It's Bump for Buddies. Was, um, Pregnant and pregnant women and women with young children, and it's an opportunity for advice in those sessions. They also do some form filling for those in that as well. So that's a wider opportunity that other partners might be wanting to plug into as well. Thank you. Jenny. Yeah, I think um, I think we'll, we should put a, a message out to our community infrastructure organisations as well, shouldn't we? I can see Joyce Lynn uh, from Shepherd Fold uh, on on the call, who I know is working with lots of uh, yeah parents and young people, um, and maybe it's something that um, your organisation would be interested in. I think you missed the first part of it, but we'll send through the information. It sounds like a really fantastic piece of work, and to have that opportunity to um, make sure that you're working with a diverse kind of range of projects um on this and, and developing that as an offer from their existing projects feels like a really um a really great idea Thanks so much for coming to talk to us about it does anyone else have any other ideas even if even if your organization isn't um if you do yeah if you do have any ideas of organizations you think um could be useful ones to partner with for eat club then do pop in the chat or share any ideas and we'll we'll all got, get our thinking caps on as well but all, you know organizations you. that residents you're working really with really yes yeah it's hard starting from scratch on a piece of work like this and we know um but yeah if you do have organizations that you're you know that people you're working with really trust and find um important resources in the community then do um i know that our community infrastructure organizations that we fund 24 to work with us who are working with a whole range of um people in hackney who um are struggling in in this context um i don't know um joyce lynn did you catch that did you catch that bit is it something that you think shepherd fold might be interested in i know you work with quite a lot of young parents as well don't you yes 
Joyce Lynn will follow up with me, so we'll put you in touch. <laughs> um but yeah do do put um put your thinking caps on and put it in the chat or or share or if you're listening to the recording um there'll be information within the newsletter as well that john sends out thanks so much for coming and best of luck with it thank you yeah. i mean we kind of thank feel you. like we're not totally starting from scratch so we, we have worked with Hackney in the past we have partners that work with young people and also with adults but um i think there's, there's quite a lot to fulfill in this contract so all the help is absolutely welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. If you want to send me um, the sort of the offer, if you like, in a, in a few lines, um, I can absolutely, absolutely share that in the newsletter and um, put it right to the top. So hopefully, most you know, people, as many people as possible, see it. So um, do send me something through an email, and I'll put it out to, to the rest of the list because um, yeah, it's a very broad list for our uh, non council. So. Um, Hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll get some support, please. But yeah, thanks very much for coming along. Um, we are going to move on to our next presenter. Um, so, Emma, um, do you want to come in? Emma's from Citizens Online and is going to talk to us about some work on digital inclusion. Great. Thanks, John. I'm just going to, I've got a couple of slides and I've never shared them on a Google Meet. So, let's see if I can. Ah, uh -huh, I think I might be able to do that. Can you see the slides now? Yeah, got it. Great. Okay, perfect. Um, good, great. Okay, so yes, thank you for having me here today. Um, like John said, uh, I'm Emma Koivinen. I'm the research manager from a national digital inclusion charity called Citizens Online. Um, as a quick introduction of what we do to address digital exclusion, we work with organizations to make sure their digital services and strategies are inclusive. We do research to understand different aspects of digital inclusion and exclusion. Um, and we work with learners and volunteers to help develop people's digital skills and confidence and provide access to devices and data. In Hackney, we're doing a piece of work for the council, um, and I'm going to tell you two, about two aspects of that today, about uh, digital champions and the training we're delivering and the research we're doing to map what support is available locally and what more do residents need. And I've put the links to those two on the chat as well. Um, so just as a very quick background context, I know digital inclusion and um, digital inequalities have been talked about here before, but just as a kind of quick background of the issues. So we know that residents who are most at risk of digital exclusion are those who are vulnerable otherwise too, including people who are older, disabled, people living in on low incomes, or those who have a low education level. Um, we know that people living on low incomes are less likely to be online and more likely to have low digital skills. And obviously nowadays internet access is needed to access many basic services such as benefit applications or um, ordering um, repeat prescriptions or arranging medical appointments. And while there's a cost of having an internet access and having a digital device, there's also a cost from not being able to access the best deals as those are often um, only available online and we know that cost of living crisis is making the situation worse there's estimates that there are eight million households in the uk who find it difficult to afford home broadband and there's also a lot of uh, lack of awareness of what support is available both support available in the locality, but then also national schemes such as social tariffs for broadband. Um, and I've included a link here to the Money Saving Expert website that explains what so, uh, social tariffs are, who's eligible and how to apply for those. So what help do digitally excluded residents need? There's a need for support with digital skills and confidence. There's a need for low cost or free devices and connectivity. And there's a need for improved awareness of what support is available, both for the residents themselves and for um, staff working with residents. And there's a need to have more digital champions in different settings. 
Uh, we know from research the good practice approach to supporting digitally excluded residents has a few key elements. First is taking a person-centered approach that, so that the support that provided meets the needs, abilities and interests of each resident. It's really important to provide choice starting from how people can engage with services. Using digital tools is not right for everyone and not right in every situation. Another key aspect of providing choice um, and variety is how the support is delivered. And that's what the images on the slide are about. So first on the left are the professional digital champions. Like I said, here at Citizens Online, as in many other organizations, we have staff members whose job it is to support people with digital skills and confidence. And in the middle, there's what we call embedded digital champions. So these are, for example, reception staff in council buildings or at a GP surgery, or could be benefit advisors or staff in a food pantry and, and, and so on. So these are people who, as part of their work or volunteering role, support uh, digitally excluded people to use a specific service or to give them initial help or to signpost them to further support if that's what they need. And then the third group are digital champion volunteers. Obviously in Hackney, there's the digital buddies um, who can provide more in-depth support similarly as the professional digital champions. In an ideal situation, there should be a mix of the different types of digital champions in each locality who can provide support to digitally excluded residents in a way that suits them. And to increase the number of digital champions across different organizations in Hackney, we're running digital champion training sessions. So these are free sessions for staff and volunteers from organizations who are interested to support Hackney residents with digital skills. So who can take part in this training? It's anyone who's working with people who are digitally excluded, um, mainly targeting voluntary and community sector organizations. Um, and to be a digital champion, you don't need to be an expert with technology. It's more important to be patient, a good communicator and have a passion to help others. The training we run, it's an online training. It's an hour and a half um, and it will give uh, confidence to help residents with digital devices and digital skills. We talk about how to support people, what are the barriers people can face. We address online safety and cover some typical questions and situations. And we provide resources that can be used after the training. There's a link to the Eventbrite page for booking to these sessions. We're running one session before Christmas on the, I think it's Wednesday, 13th of December. Um, and then there's four more sessions in the new year. And like I said, it's free um, to attend, but the organizations need to ensure that staff and volunteers have a DBS check in place. But if there's organizations who are interested in doing attending the training and providing this support for residents, um, but are unable to offer DBS checking at the moment, there is support available from the council for that. So you can still book on the course in the registration form. There's a place where you can kind of tick to say, please contact me to discuss the support for the DBS checks. And then the other aspect of the work we're doing is we'd very much like to hear from you. Like I said, we're doing research to understand what support do residents need with digital skills, confidence and access. We want to hear about any support you provide or would be interested to provide. We've launched the, the survey today, so it's all fresh and, and newly out there. But we're also going to have time to discuss today, hopefully. So you're very welcome to um, have any comments afterwards. There's also our email address. Um, on the slide and I put it in the chat as well if anyone wants to contact us directly. And then over to you. So here's some of the key questions from us um, or if there's any questions for me or anything else you'd like to raise, uh, there should be time for that. So some of the questions we're interested in, what do residents tell you are barriers they face to getting online? Do you provide any digital support at the moment? Would you know where to signpost people for support? And if you're aware of any, what more support is needed? That's another question. Thank you. 
Thank you, Emma. Brilliant stuff. Um, and yeah, really important work for this digital uh, education comes up sort of pretty much every meeting in terms of, you know, services not just that we're not going to have access to help entities, which um, should be, you know, simple to, you know, you think, you know, you think in a perfect world, everyone will be able to get the help they need, but unfortunately they can't. So, um, uh, really important work. So, I'm going to bring in, I think it was Charlie first. I mean, you could bring Penny, it's fine, but I, I was just going to ask. Um, have you been in touch with Madeline Maxwell, who works in the NHS? Because I know that they've been doing work on this as well, and it feels like very connected. Yes, yeah, I've got them. Um, I've met with her a few months ago, and, and I'm going to get in touch with her soon again. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right, uh, Penny. Hi. Um, it sounds brilliant. I just don't want to clash with anything that we've already got going on. Um, if we're allowed to collaborate or not. Because uh, we're registered with the Good Things Foundation, so yep. as part of the Data Bank and the Device Bank, um, is that something where I'm allowed to do both, or do I have to stick to just one? No, no, you don't need to stick to just one. So what we're doing at the moment is very much just kind of mapping and gathering the information of where the support is available locally, and then mm. so the offer that you're providing um, through the Good Things Foundation is great. Um, and exactly the kind of information we want to include. And we'll liaise with uh, John and Jenny's team then to see if we can create a signposting map or some resource so that anyone who's working with residents can find out where they can get help and support. Mm. So the barriers we're facing at the minute is I would, I would love more than anything to expand the services for there. And that uh, Good Things Foundation do offer training, but I felt like it was a bit of a waste on me at the minute just okay. because the uh, community halls team where we hire the space from um they've been promising wi-fi since well for a year and a half now and it's still not installed so where we operate from is like a dead zone the only uh, thing we rely on is mobile data dongle that we use from the sim cards we've got and yeah. it doesn't always work um so i would hate to promise something to a resident and then sit yeah. down even the advice sessions that we do now, sometimes I'm having to run outside, get a connection, <laughs> run back in, and um, people that are coming are saying, where's the Wi-Fi? But I'm saying use mobile hotspot and yeah. um, try and get on our Wi-Fi, but in certain pockets of the building, you just can't even get a mobile phone signal. Oh, so yeah. if that's something where we can work with anyone to try, I've tried even business broadband, but they block it oh. because I've got a lease agreement. We want a higher agreement, so we are stuck until we get Wi-Fi to expand and help more people. Oh, that's so frustrating, and that's yeah. such a, a basic thing. It's it a shouldn't block. Be. It's a Absolutely. block for everything. Because there's no point me even trying to get more volunteers trained and to help when we can have all the knowledge there. But if you haven't got Wi-Fi, you can't do anything. And yeah. that is, we're we're actually digitally digitally excluded as a charity to try yeah. and then help people who are digitally excluded themselves. Yeah. So how how does that work? Well, I don't even know how to. I mean, obviously, we can we can look into that and fight with the community halls team, but that's just yeah, we've got a, a, f a few more more important issues first to deal with financially with them, other than the Wi-Fi. <laughs> but that's um, that's so both for you're very welcome to join the come and along to the training session or send any of your staff or volunteers, and um, but also if you're able to, I I've scribbled notes while we're talking, but also if you fill in the survey we're obviously from the survey we'll feed back all the findings back to the council so if we're kind of if people are repeatedly saying these kind of issues that's mm. we're going to be flagging that back to them as well when, when people come for food um we offer them to connect to the mobile data um mm. sorry the mobile dongle that we've got for them just to get connection obviously over conversation we build up find if they need internet if they're running out and then we offer them a sim card if we've got any and then that opens up more conversations which when i'm there is do you need further help I was actually a store manager for five years at Carphone Warehouse, but I don't want too many people finding out about that because I'm very rusty now. <laughs> Obviously, technology has changed a lot, so I've yes. forgotten a lot of the things, but yes. I, I do enjoy sitting down and, and showing an old dear how to set up the phone and do the Google and all of that stuff. Right. I actually enjoy doing it, so um, I would love to get back into that and help loads of people, but we need Wi-Fi, yeah. yeah. And sorry, which organisation are you from? Uh, Idia's Community Kitchen. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So, yeah, I'll sign up to the training if that's okay for December. Yep, brilliant. Please do. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Great. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Penny. Um, Councillor Charlton. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I'd also like to sign up for training, but probably not until the end of February. Um, uh, I mean, before this meeting, I was with an 85-year-old resident who's just got himself into a right mess. And it's, you know, so he's got fines flying through the door at a rate of knots. And he's got no idea how the internet works. He hasn't got Wi-Fi. He couldn't use it if he had it. Um, you know, it's just, it's so exclusive, isn't it? And, you know, I just think that the council's not really taking this on board, you know, that there are people who, you know, just cannot cope with the digital age. How are we dealing with this? I suppose it's a question for John as much as anything else, you know, sorry to bring this in John but you know it's like how do I advise this person yeah I mean I was kind of going to say something uh similar really but, I mean it's obviously good to be able to train people and you know give people information about how to use digital tools and the internet and and you know in an ideal world everyone will be able to pick that stuff up and you know we could all move to fully digital and everyone will be caught up as it were but that's 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 assuming that the problem is on them almost, whereas actually it's a two-sided problem. There's, you know, people have got a lack of skills, which we can do our best to help with, but actually it's also about the other side of the coin, which is, yeah, council services or, or any services that are just that are exclusive and not meeting people where they are. So, yeah, you can get a bit closer to ideal by changing people up, but, you know, we've got to move that in that direction and closer to them as well. Um, so I don't have the answer. I guess I'm just recognising that I agree with you, <laughs> but I don't know much. It's, it's very difficult, I think, um, especially when, I suppose, you know, but by definition, often people designing services obviously do have those skills. So inevitably, they, they, find they, they might just find it hard to put themselves in the shoes of someone who doesn't, not because, you know, of any fault of their own. It's just sort of, you know, they're not in the same place. So um, there's a sort of service design element to it as well um emma did you want to come in or, or jenny don't mind to go next. yeah, yeah I, was, I was going to ask emma whether it's within scope for this piece of work which is uh you know which we're really we're really glad of but whether it's within scope to be looking at some of those and sharing back some of those barriers some of that insight that in in your work um from those partners you know like you've heard from penny and from um councillor Troughton in terms of the realities of trying to support residents on the ground to kind of um to to navigate those systems and and what what um what we need to learn as a set of services um in the council but also you know in health um so that we can um keep building that case because i know that um this space you know i think that one of the things that's been really valuable in this space and having so many people together who work with residents directly is when services come and present on their offer and then we hear back from um those who are working with residents who are really struggling um that actually what about this person who hasn't got that or what about this person who hasn't got that i mean we had conversations i think shahid was on the line you know what about the person who doesn't have a bank account that's all very well for them but you know <laughs> i could do or what about the person who doesn't um who english isn't their first language and i know we've been doing lots of that work and we've been um john's been leading some workshops around um you know what we need to do more and different in terms of our approaches to translation and um, accessibility there so there's there's so much work for us to do as a system so much for us to learn so is it is it within scope of the research to sort of tell us what yeah tell us what isn't working and, and share that insight so we can also um make the case for change where those residents and partners are telling us um things are not working for them right yes yes um yeah very good points all of these and and like i said in the presentation what we always say is services shouldn't be just digital there's always going to be people who can't access services digitally and obviously in an ideal world um if 80 percent of people go or 90 percent access services digitally that should free up capacity then to help those who need need the help um and then jenny for your question yes um i will go and double check the survey i'm fairly sure there's questions kind of related to that already on on what would um 
what would your organization need to support people more and what are the barriers people face and there are a few kind of open boxes where people can add more details as well but i'll make sure there is and yet yeah, we're it's great if we're getting already the feedback from here today is is great so i'm really looking forward to hearing more from everybody brilliant um penny did you want to come back in or is that a legacy yeah old hand sorry uh, no worries um council charleston did you want to come back in if you don't mind yeah, yeah um uh, i mean yeah I th and just to just reinforce that point that you know um the time will come when everyone is able to be digital but we are not there yet and at the moment we've left a number of elderly people stranded and you know um they are getting this they're getting into all kinds of problems and what i really noticed with this chap today is that it's really affected his mental health he's very paranoid um he feels abandoned um you know he's he's kind of his perception of the bureaucracy is that they are victimizing him you know and um so he's he's really uh he's just unable to cope you know and this is very serious you know i'm sh i know for a fact he's not alone you know i've met other people that have you know got themselves into such deep water um you know that they end up feeling feeling this way um as a council you know we should not be in the business of making people mentally ill we must provide for these people and it's very disappointing i've emailed um several times for this uh resident and you know i just get this sort of standard response you know go online go online do you know what i mean yeah thanks council Carlson. um hannah i think you're next uh, I feel like as a representative of a Haredi organization, I should flag it up that it's uh, the barriers the community faces, cultural bar barriers to uh, to access internet. They, they vary from community to community uh, because the Haredi community is so diverse. So some people would be, for cultural religious reasons, choosing not to use internet at home at all, maybe only for work some of them and that's also a case with our disabled women and especially their carers would feel extremely uncomfortable if for example we brought a tablet into the session uh, but uh, organizing uh, digital courses uh, on the PCs is fine um, so there's a, a, a lot of variety of opinion here within the community and it's not um, doesn't correlate to age it correlates to the community and the uh, and uh, what people's views are so it's not going to be something that in 10 years time may change that much uh of all things do evolve within the community as well uh, that's all Thanks, yeah that's, that's a really important point maybe um yeah definitely be worth thinking on with everyone i think to give a bit more detail about that um about about those sort of uh differences within the community um that would be really good uh emma did you want to come back when that or should uh, go on to genevieve? how about you go genevieve first and then i can um reply on on any final comments Brilliant. thanks emma thanks john and everybody uh just a little bit of feedback i volunteered with uh, digital buddies uh, a couple of times it was very interesting um about, I only had about an hour, but that was still good to go in and see. And what I, different levels of ability in that digital buddy space. But what I really noticed was the elderly people there were so afraid of the predatory possibilities that they've been so uh, informed that beware, beware, beware. And that really scares them anything to do online they're afraid that whoever they're communicating with online can see into their world somehow that they don't have any protections that was really sad to watch them feel so vulnerable and exposed 
And the other thing we've had recent feedback in our uh, benefits and housing needs, we have a registrar team who allow people to come in and pay their rents in cash. And they come in not because they can't do it online. They know how to do it online. They like to talk to the people there in the team. They like the live conversation. Um, but that also coincided with Digital Buddies. It was a safe space to talk to somebody, to be in the room with other people who were a different cultures, different ages, to see that not just the older people are the ones who were challenged with digital awareness. So I felt that was really uh, good for them to recognize each other. And if they're, I haven't been on a regular enough basis to know if the same people go all the time to perhaps build a relationship or a safe place. Um, or if they, eat, you know, anything takes practice, if you don't do it all the time, if you only go one day a week, who can remember what I did this morning, let alone last week, um, but being able to encourage people to do it in practice more and more. Uh, anyway, that's just my feedback. And thank you very much, Emma. Good luck to you on all this. Thanks. Frank, thanks, Genevieve. I think as well, the, um, the point about the sort of fear of using the internet and people being able to access your information. I mean, obviously, unfortunately, we, there was a cyber attack at Hackney as well, which, you know, I, I can mention publicly, obviously, that was public knowledge. So, um, like, people's worst fears kind of like, <laughs> you know, that would actually happen. So, um, there's probably, it's like, maybe there's a legacy of that with people not wanting to engage digitally. And um, yeah, the point about people wanting that human interaction, I don't know if people saw that, um, there was like a chain of stores up north called Booms, I think, and they'd gotten rid of their self-service checkouts because, um, you know, they just felt like people wanted that interaction with the person behind the shelf. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, Neil, did you want to come in and then Emma can react to all the yes, comments? and totally agree. We've got a lot more to do. I just want to be a positive voice and say I've been around London for years in about five or six three councils and we've got an asset that a load of them don't have because they shut them down and that's hsc so i completely agree with emma we need to digitize for those who want the let's i'm going to be really shouldn't use stereotypes the shortage trendies who want to come online and don't want to talk to us want to do it all and that is everything will give us the opportunity in the space to help those who really need it so i totally agree with everyone but I also think we've got a massive opportunity because we've got a building that a lot of councils have shut down. You go to some of my colleagues in other London boroughs and there is no space for residents to come. And it is digital or kind of no way. So totally agree we've got a lot more to do. But I think we should also say we've also got a really good space to work from, which others don't have. But that's my preaching from the pulpit done. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Excellent point. Um, Emma, did you want to come back in and respond to any of that? And then I think we'll, we'll uh, move on to the next item. Great. Yeah, yeah. Just really great to hear from everybody. Thank you. Really useful comments. And yeah, completely agree on, on things that have been discussed. Um, the, I think the two main things that I wanted to just comment on was I don't think and and I don't think most people working in the sector don't think there's going to be a time when everybody's going to be digitally included. Uh, technology changes all the time. There's always new things to learn. Um, there is obviously people with either cognitive or other disabilities might not be able to engage. And then there's circumstances like health issues where you might not be able to engage um, with digital tools. So that's that's kind of, I, I do think it's an, it's changing and obviously it's changed a lot. 20 years ago, it was about giving people computers and that would open up their world a lot nowadays it's a lot more nuanced about having the digital skills and having being able to pay for the access and so on and then the other point was around the kind of worry about the scams and and other things online that's such a big thing and it is um like i said in the training we do we do talk about online safety and i think it's it's such a it's great people are aware of of the potential risks and obviously there are major risks but it has to be balanced in a way that people know how to stay safe and how to keep the learners safe while still kind of enjoying the benefits of the internet. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been really interesting. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, thanks so much for coming along. Really looking forward to seeing how this work develops. It's a really interesting area of work. Jenny, do you want to come in? Yeah, 
Yeah, I was just going to say, Emma, if you you know do keep in touch with this group and if there's things you want to ask us or even if you wanted to deliver a kind of bite size flavour of the training to this group, um, it's relevant to, to, you know, everybody's everybody's work in this space. So, you know, even if it's something that people don't have time to come along to the full training and don't want to get the kind of um, certification, if there are top tips that you want to share, things you want to include in the newsletter, um, you know, we do have quite a large mailing list. So even those that don't come um, in person do get to watch the recording back and see the notes. So we might be able to reach quite a number of people who it will really um, support. And it's it's fantastic to have you uh, to have this resource and this opportunity to, to see what we can get to this. So thank you. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks both. Um, I think I'm going to pass on to Abby, who's also from the policy and strategy team at Hackney, who's uh, got, got an item on uh, food poverty, I believe. Yeah, thanks, John. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to do just a quick update on some work that's been going on with our population health team here in the council and, and our team in the policy and strategy service around food poverty um, and our food network. And there, I know there are a few of you on the call who have been part of this um, so I'll invite you to also share as as that comes up. And well. this is just to say this is a very spontaneous item in the background. We we just came out of this a meeting where this uh, information had been pulled together after a number of workshops, and Abby and I just thought, oh, maybe we could share with the group because we thought you'd be interested to see the outcome. So this wasn't a planned this wasn't a planned presentation, but we just thought it might be um, really relevant to those on the call, and um, you might be interested in in hearing about it, but also feeding in. So. Yes, and I'm sure everyone on the call, because we are dealing with, uh, you know, working with the front line, that we're very used to pivoting and adapting. So, <laughs> um, hopefully, you're extending some grace to me as I uh, figure out exactly what might be useful to you tonight or today. I suppose it's not night yet. Uh, so, just briefly to set the context for the work that's going on, um, and I say going on because it really is in the very beginning of this. Um, the Population Health Hub has a, a bit of money that they can put towards how we might do something around food poverty. And we wanted this to be a really um, engaging and co-produced, um, and, and I mean that in the meaningful way, not just the flippant you know, buzzword way, that we're really inviting the voices and the people who are on the ground and know the space around food and food poverty in the borough to have input and be able to steer and direct um, this work. And so, let's see. Uh, where we are so far um, is kind of in phase three, as Joya, who's leading this work, has said. Uh, we've looked at who can we bring together around the table, um, virtual and in person? Um, what data can we, can we look at? Um, and then we've had a couple in-person and then virtual sessions to, to hear from the different perspectives that are around the table about um, what's been working well in the food system in the borough, um, what's not been working well, and where might there be opportunities for us to focus on. Ultimately, we're thinking about and we're trying to figure out how we actually prioritize this question of how can we have a sustainable food system here that also support, supports people to get out of food poverty and also can support health and well-being needs. Uh, we know that's a pretty big ask, um, but we want, we want to make sure that some of the good stuff that's happening here um, is retained and is embraced and amplified that um, it doesn't stigmatize, that it's not coming from top down, that it really is um, generative off of what we're learning from the community and the strengths that, that are there, um, that's based on what's already been happening and that is really based on strengths and not deficits. So with that in mind, I wanted to share today what has been the kind of come out of those first couple of meetings on, on where food partners in the borough were sharing those thoughts. Um, this is actually the first time I have I have shared on a, a Google prese presentation screen versus Zoom, so I um, hope it's not too bumbly for you. Okay, so we've got here a summary of those sessions 
um, the, the things that are working well based on what people were sharing at these meetings, that we're seeing some real strengths in the collaboration, the networks, um, some creativity, uh, a real vibrancy that's happening, especially in the volunteering community sector. Um, that people are being very responsive to food poverty. Um, and you can see some of the models and some of the um, evidence there in community engagement. But there's been some council support in the the enabling. What can we what can we um, hold and support or prop up uh, and in food distribution? But there's also been barriers um, and and some of these are I'm sure felt pretty acutely in terms of the structural issues with the food system where it is uh, lack of long term solutions, some some real structural deficiencies. Um, where the food system is failing um, in different ways. Um, some challenges around working across the system with each other. Um, the funding challenges that are very real to all of us, uh, where it's and voluntary and community sector feeling this probably most of all um, in terms of the short-term um, project-based grant funding that is, exists and that whole process that, that needs to be um, gone through for all of these different funds that it takes to do the growing work and the growing need. Um, but there's a lack of business model for food risk redistribution, recurrent funding that, that's non-existent that makes planning difficult, um, and, and down the line. Um, but moving to kind of what we've been seeing as some potential opportunities um, and some areas that we've got a steering group that's both council um, teams or, or people from the council, as well as some of our community and volunt voluntary sector partners who are, are going to be doing the work of how do we take this rich feedback and prioritize? What, what can we do <laughs> with a small pot of money? What can we start on? Um, where is there maybe a window of opportunity um, that we can start tackling um, some of the issues that came up, but in very much a strengths-based way that sets the stage for future, better, bigger things. Um, so we've got some ideas around sustainable funding and support, around community engagement and education, around integrating services and wraparound support, um, some influence on policy change and advocacy, and then some around the supply chain and collaboration. And within that, there's a, a massive list um, and I'll stop sharing here, but I will send this in the a link in um, the chat here so that if you want to look and spend more time with this information, um, that you would be able to do that. And that should go through there. Um, but, but really what we're doing now as a group, and we just met earlier this afternoon, is trying to, to get a sense of what's out there right now. We know of a few things like the, the money that the Population Health Hub has to support this work. Um, we've been talking with our, our team in inclusive economies and um, like I met with the Felix project yesterday and just hearing about these different possible green spaces or funding opportunities um, or potential paths that could be explored or joined together as we're looking at where might this work go? What might we, ch we choose to try out in our food network? And so I suppose the ask here tonight is if any of you on the call um, know of any of these green spaces or things that are currently going on that it'd be really helpful for us to know about, uh, please do share uh, because our next step is really trying to get a sense of what's out there, what's the lay of the land so that we can, with all the information available to us as a steering group, um, prioritize that list that I shared on the, on the screen and say, what can we choose to try out and to, to do something in the food space to make it better for those experiencing poverty or better for the food system in general or everyone interacting with it. So I'll pause there and I suppose invite um, anyone who's been a part of that work so far, if you wanna join in and share your experience or add anything that I might've missed. Um, and then we can open the floor for questions. Thanks, Abby. Does anyone have any questions, or do you want to add anything, Janik? 
Yeah, well, I was wondering first, yeah, whether um, Penny or Ali or whether um, Joycelyn or, yeah, colleagues who've been supporting um, residents with food and who've been really, um, yeah, developing these approaches might want to reflect on anything. Um, Ali's in our steering group, which is brilliant um, and represents two organisations and so has been right in the heart of all of this, haven't you? Did you, uh, yeah, any, any sort of thoughts or questions for the group? Ali, from you? No, <laughs> oh, no, no worries. Penny. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I missed the first part of it, so I'm sorry uh, about that. But there was a lot of information to take in as well. So, um, from what I've gathered, there is just to let you know that we work with Felix Project, Fair Share, City Harvest. So, since we've had deliveries like that, it's changed the game from not just collecting from all the supermarkets and local businesses because that's how we started off um so we're still collecting them like seven days a week and giving them out to everyone that we can meet and reach but it's just in increased the volume that we can have and increase the level of cooking that we can do to recycle the food because we're all about reducing food waste um so yeah that's what we do mainly but if it wasn't for the deliveries we wouldn't be able to put on the pantry and then we wouldn't be able to make the income from the donations that we ask which is increased to five pound donation now per person uh, to be able to pay for the running costs to, to continue um so yeah we're making a massive impact in the community for reducing food waste and we don't just do that now we've obviously expanded in uh, different areas such as emergency clothing um theater and device bank uh we do advice sessions signposts and referrals um, we're forever growing and we're going into the hygiene side of things and trying to set up a shower scheme for people who are unable to keep clean and obviously that can help people's mental health to be able to give them the boost they need to be able to get into work and yeah so we're just always trying to look for different avenues really but it always starts with food people haven't got food then yeah That's so such a I don't know if that answers any of it because obviously I missed the first part of like where you're from, Abby. So I don't know. I don't know what organisation I'm talking to, but from what I've gathered, that's I thought that's what you needed to know. Is that right? That's such a good example of exactly what we're talking about, Penny. And I guess that's that's such a good example of how when we're talking about our food network, we're not just talking about people who are being fed. We're talking about the really important role preventative mm. role role in early intervention um and holistic support that our food partners have been providing and that evolution from initially just having you know having some food to give to people that were hungry and then moving into a role where um you're an absolute lifeline for residents who might not otherwise have have that support so i think that's such a good example when you think about the outcomes that you're you know the boxes that you're ticking there reducing food waste um you know health health well-being mental health you know it, it, it families clothes i mean there's there's just so many things isn't there and it doesn't just fit i think one of the biggest challenges is it doesn't fit within a, a particular services remit in terms of what we're measuring and outcomes and things like that which makes it a, a bigger challenge but uh, but you know also a really important opportunity for a group like this to be thinking about and for for a kind of cross sector partnership working sorry Joycelyn your your hand was going up and down then and I kept on going on so Joycelyn and then Charles yes um thank you Abby for the delivery uh, we have our food from another hub to our end. So we use a um, uh, volunteer driver to pick our food every week and which we can we don't have much at the moment. Sometimes now, uh, before we open the door, about 15, 20 people line up outside. And by 11, we open 11 o'clock by 12, later 12, 30, the food is finished with so nothing for the next day. So what we do, we have a small can that we put there so people can put some little donation. Luckily, last time we opened, we got about 200 pounds out of the can. So we use it to buy extra food to support the service. So at the moment, we are really struggling and we have food, um, we have collection from Sainsbury's, which is only bread and snacks. Um, so our food is not really enough for the people and it's affecting their mental well-being recently we have a, somebody that comes and whatever we have he wants to eat there because he's a homeless man 
He's a homeless man, so there's nowhere he can go and cook. Uh, he has no, in fact, he's sleeping in his car. It's yesterday I, I sampled him to a greenhouse because he'd been sleeping in his car for two weeks. So he was passing by, he saw our sign outside and he came in. So since then he'd been eating in our place. He just come, sit down, eat, uh, talk to us, read books, read papers, and then go away. Um, so we, food bank have really need extra help because with this time, this situation will affect the poor man. He's 77 and he's been sleeping in his car, doesn't know where to go, who to talk to. So find our place, it's like he has found a family. So he'll be coming there, sit down, we warm food for him, he eats, waited, have a cup of tea. So it's like our place has become his own uh, place of belonging. So um, yes, so I think if we can get a little more help so that we can support people, not only food aspect, at least he needs somebody that he can spend time to talk to, explain his situation. At least finally, I was able to send him somewhere he can not sleep in his car. He was so happy that I was able to help him out so that he can stop sleeping in his car. At the age of 77, I think it was not right. But um, yeah, so we, we really need extra support. Mental well-being is really an issue now. I uh, had a woman that talking, crying, talking, crying. You can see that he's, in fact, even what he came to me for was not an issue. Food was not an issue. The mental state, you can see that he, he was from one topic from another, one topic from another, one topic. So you can see that even mentally he's not stable. So, um, yeah, but if we, if we can open our door, for people to have a place to go, talk to us, have food as they need, I think it will be very helpful. So thank you for the presentation. Sorry for taking time. <laughs> no, please, Jocelyn. That's really it's really important for us to hear that and be thinking about that. And I suppose it's making me think. You know, what what role can we all play in in putting the call out for, you know, donations to organisations like yourselves, so so that you're not having to turn people away who are in that kind of situation because that's just critical, isn't it? And in this weather, it's it's. Thank you, um, Charles. Thank you very much for for the presentation. Everyone presented very well. I uh, just wanted to give a general uh, comment uh, because we keep uh, we talk about uh, doing holistic approach in in the service delivery, but um, I need to say we are acting like DJs who play music they like and not the music people like. The reason I'm saying this is because a lot of the time we we design a very lovely uh, program and take it to the people. But the reason those programs fail is because the people were not involved in the initial stage. Therefore, people look at it and say, well, what is all this? You can build a brand new building and get people there, but they wouldn't like it. So the approach that would really be holistic is to start from the foundation, get people involved. What do they want? For example, with the digital um, inclusion thing, if you go to the people and tell them, um, you know, we are now going digital. What do you think? What can we do to make you like it? Other than saying, oh, everything has to be, you have to do everything online. You know, we are just putting food into the people's mouth, not willingly, because they are not willing to eat the food we are, we, we are serving them. So we have to change our approach, just that we go to the people, take the service to the people, not let people come to our service, and then we tell them, oh, go online. I, I heard what Councillor Lin said, it's so painful, because a person who is 85 years old, supposed to do things digitally, not uh, in their lifetime, they were watching, we were watching black and white TV those days and all that. So digital is not for everyone, okay? So we need to change our approach, how we engage with people so that they, they grab the digital world 
positively. Okay, so that is going to the people, putting them down, talking to them, uh, and asking their input. <laughs> How can they be trained to 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 do things online? This let them give their input. However, silly answers they give. I know there are no silly answers. There could be silly questions. So let them put any input they can do. They will feel part of the program because they would have contributed something. And then they will embrace it and you will see people start being positive into uh, grabbing the, the project that we want them to do. But if we just grow a glamorous project, I can go online, grow a lovely project and say, here, present it. They will look at it and say, what is all this? So that is my humble contribution. Thank you. That's a really, it's a really important reminder, Charles. There's this lovely expression, you know, we've got to make our, our services people shaped rather than system shaped, haven't we? So and you can't make them people shaped unless you're doing it with the people. But you're uh, I'm interested, Charles, which service you're, do you work in the voluntary sector or health or council service or? Just, yeah, uh, I work in I work in benefits and and housing needs. Yes, so you know from the inside how challenging the system is, <laughs> even even yeah. working within the council. It's it's a real frustration, isn't it? When we know, yeah, when we know as council officers, um, yeah, and in health and in you know and in all of our different um, positions in the system, that the system is not working for the people who need it most. It's it's incredibly frustrating and. Um, when you can't even navigate within the system um, to support somebody in it, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's really, thank you so much for your contribution there, Charles. I totally agree. Penny. Hi, sorry, I'm not sure if I can, oh, sorry, I'm sideways. I'm not sure how that's happened. <laughs> um, Charles, I'm not sure if I can go slightly off topic, but with you being in housing needs, I've when um I've struggled the last few days. I've had quite a lot of homeless um clients come through the door where we're we're obviously giving them food and I've been working with the migrant centre for people with no recourse to public funds. So we've been doing referrals and giving them a hundred pounds, which is part of the scheme. And I've been calling all the hostels and they've all been fully booked. Um so they're left on the streets. So that's one side of it what's really hard to deal with. But what do what would you suggest or who would I contact if I've called everyone um, and they've got no local connection, no local connection to the council, so the council can't help? Um, and obviously St Mungo's, they rely on um, a council referral. So who do I contact if I'm trying to get someone a bed for the night and they're in Hackney and they've got no local connection? Obviously the with gr Greenhouse say no, Hackney Council say no, they've got no money, even if they have got universal credit, for example. I know the only option usually then is a private house share, but like, what do you do? Who do you call? How can you help that person? Have you got any suggestions? I'm just really struggling because I, I want to help, but I just don't see how I can help in them situations. Okay, well, uh, yeah, in benefits and housing need is, is a wide area. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I am a specialist in the benefit section of it. Uh, for example, if uh, it is to do with paying the, the, the housing benefit and the council tax side of it. And uh, the best person you, you can contact is, is, is uh, Jennifer Winter, who is right. the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the head of, of, of benefits and housing needs. You're also very lucky you have Josie on the call. Uh, <laughs> we did have Claire Oldham and we've got Josie Crisp, who uh, is uh, somebody who also has their hand up. So we are very lucky. Thank you, Josie. I'm just making notes. Okay, thanks, Charles. So, Josie, am I allowed to talk about this? Sorry, I just know why we've got all these people on the call. Yeah, no, that's right. If you could just recap a little bit on... <laughs> um, yeah, so, so one of them, about... for example... One of them, the, the more recent one, he's got universal credit, but he's run out because he's been paying for hotels. I got him a housing assessment with, um, green, not with Greenhouse, but he's with them. So a housing assessment with the homeless team. And they said, five years history, his local connections, Manchester, but he's on the streets here. He's only been here five and a half months. He starts a new job next week, which I don't want him to lose because he's on the streets. 
So if we can get him something for a week, for example, it's going to help him keep that job. Uh, you don't really get a homeless person who's about to start a job. So obviously he's got future pro. Yeah. Um, so he's got no money no, no, and no. I just want to get him yeah. a bed for a, like a hostel for a week, but he's got no money and no, I thought that universal credit should be able to help him with an advance or something, but he's got one or two months left and an what an old advance, so I don't think that will work. No. No, it's a difficult it really is a difficult one because um do you know he's actually registered as um homeless with us? Uh, um yeah it was but greenhouse won't help because his local connections are long enough. Yeah, the yeah. High council can't help confirm that. He was illegally evicted by a, a private landlord in Hackney. Um, and so he's been here. He's been evicted since mid-August. He's been homeless. Right. Ooh. That's a tough one. After, um, are you in touch with him at the moment, or and how how we meet? Yeah, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, he's on the street, so I was trying to get him somewhere last night, and I couldn't. Okay. Do you want to just put me a quickie? I'm actually on leave tomorrow, unfortunately. Um, if you want to email me um, the details next week. Okay, yeah, I was thinking if you want to email me the details now, then I will pass it on to someone else if they've got any ideas in the meantime, and then I can pick it up again next week. All right, if you can pop your email on the chat, Brett. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really generous of you, Josie, when, you got, when you're after five and you've got to leave tomorrow. That's so hard. The, the other organisation you might want to, to, to have a chat to, Penny, if um, if the council are really just unable to help in situations like that, is um, Side by Side, MRS, who are also a community infrastructure partner, do a lot of work um with people in situations similar to that and and they had right. we went to visit them recently um they were doing some evaluation and i happened to meet somebody they had they have regular they have regular kind of reflective supervision with a housing lawyer uh, with somebody who's really good on housing law but they also have support around um you know they have a good understanding of, of that information yeah that that would be it might be good for you to speak with um, Terry or Aaron, who are community infrastructure partners as well, because they might have ideas and they've got um, a good relationship with the greenhouse. So they'll sort of know um, around that as well. So they might, you know, they won't be able to help in necessarily an emergency and getting a bed, but they might be able to help you think about how you might manage those sorts yeah. of situations when you're coming across them in future. So I think, you know, it's worth worth tapping your colleagues in the community infrastructure uh, network as well. But thanks so much, Josie. Thank you. Yeah, I signed up to Homeless Link, <laughs> but if you pop some of their organisations, they say that you have to be referred by the council. So everything usually is deemed by the council and there's no support for anyone who can't get any help from the council. So it's yes. quite hard. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult because they sort of fall down a little gap. Do you know what I mean? So... Um, mm -hmm. We don't have a duty to house and where do they go you know you, you can't go back to manchester if he's going to start work in london um mm. yeah okay thanks for all of i'm just going to google see if i can think of anything else as well <laughs> oh, thank all right. you yeah and actually sometimes and um, quite often we have shelter on the call because there's an, they're another um organization who um will 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 be able to advise on um on his rights as you know i think i think when when Right, like advice on rights, don't know, they wouldn't be able to find a bed for the night. I think that's the problem. I put Centre Point and St. Martin in the fields in there, they're two that might yeah. be worth just exploring. Yeah, um, obviously, I there's a real problem because there's such a shortage of these spaces at the moment. So, um, mm. but you could give those two a go. And there's the Depaul Trust, I'm just checking them out. Um, so if I think of anything else, I'll pop it in the chat. Thank you, thanks a lot, Josie. All right. Thanks, Josie. And does yeah, does anyone else have any um challenging situations with with residents anonymously that they want to ask about in in this space? Um this is a uh yeah, it's a very rich space. Titlio, how are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm fine, Jenny. Hi everyone. Um I have a client who I'm working with right now. Um she lives with her mother and the mother's place. She sent me the pictures of the flat and the flat is so appalling. Lots of moldy um, walls leaking, you know, it's just so appalling. And the mom suffers from a um, form of, of condition which is affecting her breathing and all of that. And 
this family because they, their language, they speak um, Turkish, so there is a language barrier element. So, um, so the daughter said she has tried to contact someone within the council and nothing has been done for months. So I'm just wondering if anyone anyone knows someone we can contact to resolve this issue for me, please. I would really appreciate that. Yes, Charlie um, is probably a good person to, to yeah. come in. See you, Charles. Hi, Tamara. How are you? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. Um, is there landlords? So are they Hackney Council tenants? They are, yeah. Um, so if there is a mould issue, there should they yeah. should be able to book a surveyor to come and visit. If if, it, if the language barrier is the issue and they're not having a difficult they're having a difficulty communicating with the repairs team, if you can get written permission that you can advocate on their behalf, you can speak to them the council on their behalf, or if you start a phone call. If they start a phone call with you and then okay. they give the council officer permission to speak to you, they'll be able to, um, the, the repairs officer will be able to update and give okay. you more detail. Generally speaking, in a mould or damp issue, what should happen is a surveyor should review the property and assess the level, the standard of what it's at and then recommend an action. A lot of that is going to be, there's a lot of, the, unfortunately, it's a pervasive issue across the borough. So it's a difficult issue, but there are, they should be able to get a surveyor visit. So could you just clarify that? So the first point is to call, call the, the repairs. repairs with the client. Okay. Or email ahead of time. If you can get if it you can't email, if you can't do it with them, get a written letter to say okay. that you have permission to speak to the council on the client's behalf. Email email that to okay. our services so that, that can be on file okay. and then you can speak to an operative who'll be able to give you some background on what's happening. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. Charles. Thank you. Is that helpful? Yeah, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Tough one. Yeah. It's a real, it's a really difficult, it's such a difficult time for people, isn't it, as we're coming into winter. Yeah, especially coming to winter, yeah. Penny, was that an old hand or was that a new one? Old one, sorry. Okay. I was um oh, oh is that oh sorry, sorry. Oh, was that sorry. Accident? yeah I was wondering I know there's there's some new new um names I don't recognize maybe you've come before and I haven't been here but I was wondering if anyone who was kind of new to this group or who has been observing and had anything that they wanted to share in terms of any reflections or any yeah any anything that might be helpful for us to hear or be thinking about or any reflections from what you've heard so far or um or any insight from those that you're working with in terms of residents that are struggling and um i know we have i know we have vicky from the homerton on the line um which is great to yeah let's see you again after such a long time and i know i know many people just kind of um are getting on with other stuff and listening in the background as well but hi vicky sorry to put you on the spot i do have a tendency of doing that when uh, <laughs> I want to bring people in um, and I was also going to see if Aliki wanted to say hello too from Sheffield University but um how have you found is it the first one you've come to Vicky yes yeah it's the, so actually it was my my new manager Rebecca Graham who's the head of organizational development and culture she was invited and then she was like oh you should come to this and I was like oh, shit. Yeah. and I think it's really interesting for me because um I'm, my um my role is workforce focus um for I'm sure I've spoken to you about this before Jenny however of course yeah. we know the workforce are also residents and we're doing a lot of work to try and um support staff and tapping into what's available locally so this is that there's been a lot here to kind of think about and the resource you sent through earlier too um has like we're going to definitely think about how we can tap into that because yeah right. um no so that's that's my initial reflection and also of course the um the digital exclusion that's something we've really been grappling with and the assumptions we make with our staff we're like yeah just fill it out and it's like no not everyone has that capacity or the inclination even so um yeah i'm glad that you're connected with madeline as well on this work because yeah, yeah. 
That's really, that's so useful to hear, Vicky, because we are currently talking with with colleagues in health about and, and your colleague Annabelle in um, you know who's on our system wide group around the on how we can bring more health colleagues those titlios from the long COVID service and we do okay. have some regular colleagues yeah. from health who come to this space but when we send out comms about this um, meeting I think from the council I think some of our colleagues in health don't always see that it, it necessarily is for them you know we all get bombarded well, with lots of invites busy isn't it so we are actually doing um with steph cochlan we are um presenting um at the city and hackney practitioners forum on the 7th of december um and we're going to try we're going to tell people steph has agreed that we that we will call that meeting the same name as this meeting to kind of line up the branding <laughs> on it and to see if we can bring in some more health colleagues into this meeting as well because we'd really like to hear from we'd like to hear from our colleagues in health about the support that they're providing as well in this space we're always open to people presenting or asking questions but also we want to make sure that the information is as useful and relevant to um, clinicians who might be working um, with residents who are struggling but like you say those you know staff staff are struggling and and you know we're all um yeah there's there's information here that can be useful to to a whole range of people so yeah yeah if you can continue to include me and also it's just triggering me to think we've got a new equity and inclusion midwife who's working on maternity services doing, and she focuses on both workforce but also predominantly patients and i think there's definitely it'd be worth her being part of this group too so great yes yeah okay brilliant i'll follow up with you and see if we can <laughs> connect connect the dots it's great thank you nice to see you and joyce lynn you have your hand up and then i'm going to come to aliki and say hello <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Um, I just want to find out if anybody know where I can get help for uh, maybe um, TV or um, any a TV for a resident who is like oh, yes. a secondhand TV or something. Penny, anything, I something Penny because can... I. Uh, yeah because he was he had a stroke actually and um, he has been discharged from home care to his own house but there's nothing there he hasn't got tv he hasn't got ipad or anything that he can use to entertain himself and he's just by himself in fact i went to see him and living there was like <laughs> how is he going to survive so um if anything, because, and also he can't enter his bath, but occupational health said it to take a long time to do it. The carpet was bad. I was, the carpet was so bad, but he said council said they cannot do anything about it. So I was wondering if he has really contacted, who did he contact in the council that they cannot help him with anything? Um, he was sleeping in a bed for almost two, two, three weeks. After moving him from home, bringing him to his own house, he was sleeping in the couch because there was no bed. So according to him, he borrowed money from friends and he bought himself bed. But it's not a bed that he can use to make himself comfortable. It's just a normal standard bed that he just, but at least he's managing that. But if there's any way he can get help, I was taking money out. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you can. Uh, they can help him with this small TV, uh, digital institution. I can contact them and find out if they can help him with maybe Wi Fi so that I can get access to things instead of him just sitting down. I think it's not good for his mental well being. And uh, no, it sounds like it. Well, well, Penny has put in the chat. The, um, her phone number so and said if you want to just send a list of items that you think he might need yeah. she's going to look out and see if she can source them for you so i know oh, that, thank you, Benny. that would be brilliant and um money hub too and bt internet on benefits so it sounds like penny penny uh, will be able to but yeah do contact the money hub on his behalf as well and see what's what can because if there's um council issues that need unpicking around the repairs issue they might be able to look into that for you um or well for him um i know you're in touch with them if you, yeah. <laughs> yeah if you get in touch with them on that but if um yeah i hope i hope um a tv shows up for him so he's got something that would be great thank something, you so yeah because it's it was so bad i left that night eight something and it's like i don't know how he's going to do it <laughs> yeah i have to go home as well because i was tired <laughs> yeah oh yeah thank oh. you 
Thank you. Minute. Make sure you text me um, the items so I can get back to you, please. Thank you, Penny. I'll do that. Superstars. <laughs> I've just sent you both an email so you've got each other's contact details. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so I just, uh, yeah, just wanted to, it's a, it's a lovely place to end on, isn't it? But I um, I wanted yeah. to introduce you uh, to our colleague, Aliki, from the University of Sheffield, who we we were meeting with earlier today and um, at very short notice invited to join this session today. Um, and just, yeah, just wondered if you wanted to share any, I think we're going to have a, a range of presentation for the University of Sheffield to come along the next time in two weeks time. But yeah, just wondered if you had any reflections yeah. you wanted to share. What um, I'm very new in the project that um, John Bartel and Joe Cook run between uh, the University of Hull and the University of Sheffield. I'm also very new. I've only started working um, for them um, like a month ago and I'm only one day a week. Um, but it's fascinating and it's um, what I'm reading about place-based programs and how sort of you collaborate and how you work to serve the communities but to kind of see it in practice today is just really fascinating and i really enjoyed it and yeah i mean i'm blown away <laughs> so thank you for inviting me i would like to come again and see how you work and that's definitely really good information to use in the research that we will do um you know because you know it's it's very different to actually see how people work rather than to just interview and you know to gain a feel of how you do things it's just amazing and you know the way that you collaborate you exchange information you problem solve with each other um yeah and i don't think they're all from the council you you kind of they're different organizations isn't it Yep, and we have different people coming. We've been running this session, uh, John and I, since July before last, and we really thought it was a temporary, we really thought this was a sort of temporary solution to getting information out there about the cost of living crisis, kind of pots of money that were out there. And so we we just sort of thought we can't wait for the leaflet. It'll be out of date. We'll just have a meeting. And we invited everybody we knew and we'd spread the word. <laughs> all the sort of different, all the different frontline teams that we were working with, our food partners, our advice partners. But it's been a community that's continued to grow because um because of what you've heard and seen today, because people keep telling us it's useful and contributing so much and collaborating, you know, in a really um heartwarming way and, and in a way that that tells us we need to keep doing it and, and evolving this way of um working and I suppose as our um as a council you know our role of convening not always you know we, we don't have all the answers we can't meet the scale of the challenge but what we can do is to use you know use our use our le the levers that we have to try and bring people together and see if we can troubleshoot internally as well and it's always been brilliant having um councillor Troughton's been coming regularly so it's been great having the perspective of um those working as councillors in the borough as well as all of those working in the voluntary community sector and health and, and council but we we learn an awful lot from this space and we know colleagues within the council go away and take take learning from it and think about what that means for their services but also that like you've seen with Joyce Lynn and Penny that there's real sort of tangible um problem solving and Josie on the you know that that we, we get yeah people get things done so it really does um yeah yeah it, it seems like you're creating a lot of capital a social capital and yeah and also uh, it reduces isolation between you because you know working on your own can be quite hard so it's it's really important to have a community absolutely and that's um that's one of the things that uh yeah that the research team are going to be helping us to, to do is to look at how we can kind of how we can start measuring the impact of this stuff that we feel and we know is so important to us in terms of how we collaborate and how we work together across the system and how we support residents holistically but we haven't had that opportunity to really kind of measure in a yeah to have that kind of academic rigor and that sort of independent look at it because you know we, we keep hearing from you that this is a useful thing but we want to um yeah we want to sort of um be able to evidence that in a way that the system understands to be able to kind of um do more of what's helpful and less of what's not helpful so <laughs> with limited resources so thanks so much Aliki. that's really useful. thank you and uh, look forward to seeing you next time it's josie thank you
Hi, Penny. Uh, I have just, I just want to say, in case you miss it in the chat, I've emailed three people, um, just asking them if they can come up any ideas to email you. And I put your email in. I hope that's all right. So that's, that's perfect. Arto, <laughs> Joseph, and a Barry, if you hear from Barry's Money Hub, and the other two are Greenhouse, but they might have a list of possibilities. That's amazing. And I'm going to keep them contacts. So no, I no. They might be emailing me after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep mine. Come to me and I'll dive, dive, you know, see if I can get you help if yeah. you've got anything. Thank you. Um, and I have, I have to say, Josie, you were one of the first people in that um, multidisciplinary team. So I think really this, this <laughs> sort of meeting format originated way back during the pandemic. If we were to rewind back to when I first came across Josie, who alongside <laughs> other partners in the voluntary and community sector were troubleshooting on the back end of the COVID helpline. And it was, we've got this resident who needs help with this, who can help with this. And there was a sp major spreadsheet that we were all grappling with and we had yeah. health, voluntary sector and council in the room and it was it was a much more kind of um equal way of working and thinking together wasn't it Josie and then I think off the yeah. back of that I know a colleague from the early help hub that I'd brought into that space kept Josie's details <laughs> and every time a housing issue came up in the early help hub would go straight to Josie so um yeah. it's uh yeah so it's a it's a it's yeah massive credit to those of you who are going above and beyond yeah. outside of your uh outside of what you're doing yeah. and you're measured to do uh to collaborate in this way thank you thank you and if i can yeah, I, I, I just really enjoy yeah. working it works so well if we all link up together do you know what i mean okay. so. i always forget that this is not just a food group so i don't usually share things like that but then when i seen him on the call and he said yeah. housing i thought you know what i'm just going to try it and see so i thought i don't want to annoy everyone because i always talk too much on the call <laughs> But I, I, did, I did forget to mention to everyone earlier, we had some amazing news and it happened last week. Um, we actually got selected through Fair Share for comic relief filming. Um, so <laughs> we feel, you know, I thought we were going to be on the TV, so I, I just didn't want to do it. But we've done it anyway, and it's actually social media <laughs> and the evening standard. So it's actually going to get launched on the 22nd of November onwards. And it's a winter, uh, a winter food or fuel camp, yeah, food campaign. Um, through Fair Share, yeah. so it went really well, and the celebrity was Babatunde, so the old and the um So for so personal great. reasons, I filmed and then decided I didn't want to go ahead with it. So it's Aina and uh, Tayo. Um, yeah, oh. the, it went really well. It was such a great atmosphere. We stayed up till like one in the morning, changing the charity round, changing the layout to make it camera ready, and yeah, we had a great time. So see us on the on the platforms on socials and in the paper <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Well done. Well done. please send us the link yeah send us the link penny oh, so dear. we can send it out to the network as well and um and thank you all so much for for sticking with us till hoppers five and for all your contributions and all the amazing work you do with residents and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks thanks for linking us up thanks everyone <laughs> bye. 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 bye bye thank you